At the end of the 1890s, the United States was a growing world power. The Spanish-American War saw the United States make its presence felt in the Caribbean and as far away as the Philippine Islands. The railroads had united the continental U.S. Industry was booming. Inventors like Edison, Ford, and Alexander Graham Bell and many others were changing the way people lived and looked at the world. There was also a great sea change in the life of the Church of Jesus in America. Finney, Moody, and others had popularized gospel evangelism with great crusades. The holiness movement drew people from across denominational barriers to godly living. The divine healing movement that started in Europe had come to America. The passion for missions, inspired by Carey and Taylor, had fired the church with a vision for the lost. Into this larger story comes that of a Canadian Presbyterian pastor who eventually arrives in New York City. His name is A.B. Simpson. While pastoring a fashionable church, he sees the lost of Little Italy and he reaches them with the gospel. When he found that the new converts weren't welcome in his church, God led him to take a new course. He founded the Gospel Tabernacle in 1882 as well as the Missionary Training Institute and Simpson began to spread the fourfold gospel message of Christ, Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, and Coming King to all that he met. He began to share a vision for Great Commission ministries that touched the whole world. Through the Bible Missionary Convention movement, the message and mission of the newly born Alliance spread. Into this larger narrative is woven the story of two Wilmington businessmen, Ashton R. Tatnell and John Conley. In the late 1890s, Wilmington had a population of about 60,000 people and was a busy, prosperous industrial and commercial center. Tatnell and Conley were both godly Christian church members who heard about Simpson's conventions. They rode the train to New York and were soon captivated by the vision and message of reaching the regions beyond with a full gospel message of Jesus. They returned to Wilmington with a conviction that a branch of the Alliance should be formed in their city to promote the mission and message of the Alliance. On July 7, 1897, the first meeting was held in Tatnell's home on 1403 Jackson Street with 16 charter members. During these early years, like the wilderness wanderings of Israel, the little band moved several times. In 1898, they met at the Red Men's Lodge at Delaware Avenue and Scott Street. 1901 saw them move into a storefront on 610 Lombard. Then another storefront with more room was found at 7th and Lombard. In 1909, they actually purchased a building at 504 Shipley Street, and they remained there for a few years. In 1915, they moved into their first permanent church at 504 West 5th Street. The church was ably led by Tatnell and Conley through the first years, inviting Reverend G. Werner Brown in 1901 to be their first pastor. This godly man led the church for 10 years, then became a district superintendent and later home secretary of the Alliance. Brown was followed by Reverend John Cox, one of the original members who pastored from 1911 to 1915. His daughter Sarah was sent out as one of the early Alliance missionaries in 1899. Reverend Cox left the Wilmington Alliance to start the First Assembly of God Church in Wilmington in 1917 and was followed by Reverend H. M. Schumann, who later became the president of the CMA. Reverend Schumann is the one that moved them into their new building at 504 West 5th Street. From the beginning, the Wilmington Alliance's DNA had several outstanding characteristics. They were a people of fervent prayer, prayer meetings well attended by all ages, all night prayer vigils. Sacrificial giving to missions was evident from the first their first registered uh, missionary offering taken in 1897 was over $1,000, which would today be the equivalent of about $32,360. The whole church was involved in evangelism and outreach. The Sunday breakfast mission was a major outreach of the congregation. There was a strong youth ministry, lay-led, which involved the young people in all facets of church life. The youth were sent off to Nyack and other ministry training schools at an amazing rate. 
Reverend Richard Bailey told me that he was a 68th student sent to Nyack from Wilmington in the 1940s. More than 70 pastors, missionaries, and Christian workers have been sent out worldwide through the church. Just look at this page from the first offering cash book of the Wilmington branch of the Alliance. On November 25, 1899, Mrs. Anna Smalley gave 75 cents, about the average for the working class members of the church. But through her prayers and the vision of the Wilmington branch, she sent her son, Dr. C.F. Smalley, and his wife to India in 1899. Before she finished her life's journey, she had sent a daughter to China, another to the Belgian Congo, and five grandchildren went to Burma, the Philippines, Colombia, Ecuador, and Haiti. This was the heart of the church. In 1899, young Richard Forrest and bride-to-be went to Nyack from Wilmington. And after graduation, they were sent to Miami, Florida because health conditions would not allow their being sent out as missionaries. Eventually, Simpson asked Forrest to begin a work in Atlanta, Georgia, which he did. In 1909, Ashton Tatnell left Wilmington and took over the work, and Forrest began what, what came to be the Toccoa Falls College. God was using this young, growing church in amazing ways. The church became known as a place where people were healed and lives redeemed. We have two documented cases of men who came on crutches and were healed and walked out whole. The blind were given sight and the deaf regained their hearing. Alcoholics found Christ, were delivered and became model citizens and ardent church members. Homes were put back together and the church counted with the favor of the city. The growing congregation took very seriously its responsibility to teach and disciple the believers, to make them true disciples of Jesus Christ. Sunday school perfect attendant pins were highly coveted by young and old. Some maintained perfect attendance, never missing a Sunday for five, ten, or up to twenty years. There was a unique Sunday school class in Wilmington called the Young Men's Class in the Corner. And it was led by two ladies, Minnie Willers and Jenny Matthews. It was later called the Will Math class. These two women taught a large class of single and later married men for years. The Wilmington Alliance sent out many pastors and missionaries who were amazingly used by God. One of the unique stories is that of Reverend Mario Gribano and his wife Blanche, who was the sister of Minnie Willers. The Gribanos were CMA missionaries to Tibet, serving from 1922 to the communist takeover of Tibet in 1949. During their years of ministry in this wild country oppressed by Buddhism that saw one-fourth of the male population living as monks in the multitude of monasteries and temples, the Gribanos had a great challenge. Demonism was rampant. The religious government was corrupt and oppressed the people. On one occasion, the Gribanos received a nomad band's chief who had his stomach sliced open in a knife fight. They washed his protruding intestines, pushed them back into the cavity, sewed him up and gave him what medicine they had, and then they prayed. Two weeks later, he was able to leave their home. When he was ready to attack those who had wounded him, Gribano preached Christ's message on forgiveness, and the man relented. The seed was planted. In 1937, Gribano was able to teach English and photography to one of the living Buddhas and secretly gave him a Bible and thoroughly evangelized this young boy whose role was to rule the souls of men. Only time will tell final results of this missionary family that went on to serve in Israel and Hong Kong until retirement. Anita Bailey, part of the Bailey family, went to French Indochina, now called Vietnam, in 1937 and served for several years in Saigon until the Japanese Imperial Army invaded and she was interned with many other missionaries. She was eventually freed and repatriated, returning to the United States on the famous Swedish freedom ship Gripsholm. She later became the long-term editor of the Alliance Weekly, now called A Life. Her brother Nathan later became the president of the Christian Missionary Alliance. Brother Tom taught at Nyack for years and eventually became president. Young Dickie Richard became a pastor, district superintendent, 
and eventually the Vice President for U.S. Church Ministries for the Alliance. This amazing family was led by Nathan Bailey Sr., a godly businessman who ran a barber shop and beauty salon who regularly preached in the church and at local preaching points. Strong, godly lay leadership, coupled with pastors with vision and passion, led the church through its glory years. The Second World War came, and the Wilmington Alliance sent dozens off to war, and none were lost. In the closing days of the war, Sam Watkins, a B-17 pilot and member of the Wilmath Sunday School class, had a tremendous experience. They were counting the days for the war to end, and he was on an easy mission to bomb some rail yards. However, on that night, the lead navigator aired, and the whole flight ended up flying directly into the most heavily defended industrial site in Germany, Schweinfurt, a ball bearing factory. When Sam saw the black clouds of flak, he shouted to the crew, Hang on! If you're not a prey, do it now! Sam was terrified by the enemy fire. He hung on, the plane bucked, and he steered right into the flak, singing at the top of his lungs, He is able to deliver thee, he is able to deliver thee. Once the bombs were dropped, they reversed course, and amazingly enough, they got home with dozens of holes all over the wings and fuselage. That same night, God woke up Jenny Matthews. She prayed fervently for God to protect Sammy. The next day, she told Sam Sr., Brother Sam, the Lord told me that Sammy's coming home. He's going to be all right. And Sam came home unscathed. Jenny passed away the day before Sam arrived in America. Eventually, the church home at 504 West 5th Street was no longer adequate. Most of the members had moved away. The neighborhood was in transition, and God led their new pastor, Reverend John L. Sturziger, to look for land. Eventually, property was found a block or so from the new church parsonage. A beautiful lot was located on the corner of 29th and Van Buren, with ample space for the building and parking. The land was purchased and construction basically done by the layman of the church. This second long-term site, dedicated with the presence of D.S. Joel McGarvey, was a blessing to the neighborhood. Reverend Emerson Ross followed Pastor Sturziker and then Reverend Jerry Wellborn. Vacation Bible schools, evangelistic meetings, deeper life campaigns, active Sunday school, and music ministry characterized the years at 29th and Van Buren. However, by the mid to late 70s, another move seemed advisable. Constant flooding in the church basement, vandalism, and neighborhood tension eventually led the church to buy a beautiful corner lot in the newly discovered suburb of Hokessen. But there were no buyers for the Van Buren church, and enthusiasm waned. Then the Lord brought Reverend Robert Slane to the church in 1978. At a pastor's retreat, God gave him a deep sense of assurance to believe that the property would be sold very soon. And there begins another story. When he arrived back in Wilmington on the very next day, a very tall, distinguished African-American pastor came in. His name was then Reverend Thomas Weeks. And he asked if the church was for sale, even though there was no sign out front. With that rapid answer to prayer, Pastor Slane said yes and began to work with Pastor Weeks. His newly founded church did not have sufficient credit with the banking system to be able to get a mortgage. However, through an acquaintance of Pastor Slane, a Lutheran layman and bank vice president, the church, First Alliance Church, was able to secure a bridge loan that was then extended to Reverend Weeks' church so that they could buy and move into 29th and Van Buren and construction could begin at Hokessin. This was definitely a God thing and a sign that God was moving the church to a new area. The church was again built largely by the members and soon they were able to dedicate their lovely new building and set about reaching a new area with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Soon after the dedication, Reverend Slane left and was followed by Reverend Lloyd Powell, a dynamic and energetic pastor and leader. The church grew for several years. Missionary candidates John and Betty Arnold came, led the youth, and eventually went off to Africa. John and Colleen Schley did likewise, serving the youth and then going to the Dominican Republic. The church had a large youth group, and some went off for training and entered the pastorate. 
Following this period of leadership, Reverend Lloyd Morrison, a young pastor with his family, arrived in 1991. He and wife Susan ministered during a period when the church actively reached out to the neighborhood. Reverend Lauren Solfrank with Cindy and their teenage children arrived in 1995. Together they worked with the Morrisons to evangelize the lost and disciple those who believed. In 1998, following Morrison's leaving for an Alliance Church in Illinois, Reverend Charlie, Hara, and Donna arrived with their four young sons. Charlie's excellent ministry of preaching and teaching characterized his time in First Alliance. Fun fairs, vacation Bible schools, outreach to the Ojibwe Indians in Minnesota were all part of the church's ministry. God had continued to call those from First Alliance into his service. After several short-term trips to Burkina Faso, Larry and Karen Walters sensed that God was leading them to give up the good life of America for a ministry in this dry desert land that was increasingly thirsty for the gospel. So begins the Walter story. With their two kids, Abby and Micah, they left for the field in 2004. And today they are impacting people and helping to build his church in this West African country. Then Fred and Josie Firstbrook, longtime First Alliance members and highly involved in the life of the church, returned to China in 2005 to take up their ESL ministry, teaching English as a second language. This is something they had tasted several years before. Today, with their daughter Becca, they minister to the, gos the gospel to bright Chinese students who will lead their country in the future. Randy Jones, another member of First Alliance, has been in China since 2001 doing ESL ministry, and he continues there today. These are all signs that the original missions-hearted DNA of the church continues to be felt in the body. Following Pastor Harris leaving for a church in New Jersey, Dave and Judy Jones were called from Brazil to lead First Alliance. Still assisted by Pastor Lauren Saul Frank, and then with the coming of Pastor Chris and Faith Mercurio together, they're reaching the lost in Hokessin. These last few years have been challenging, with the church going through a period of healing and renewal. The twin emphasis of becoming a Great Commission church fueled by a movement of prayer are paramount. We continue with Vacation Bible Schools, the Minnesota Mission to the Ojibwe, Angel Tree, Art Camp, and Awana. These are all efforts to reach families that are lost near and far. First Alliance continues to be a church that loves to support missions recognized by the Christian Missionary Alliance. Our missions festivals are a high point in the church year. Great Commission Sundays regularly emphasize different people groups that need the gospel. And partnering with the Mid-Atlantic District and New Life Alliance Church of Newark, we're helping support the church planning efforts of Ty and Brandy McMillan and their Urban Impact Ministry. As we tell these stories, and as we remember and rejoice, we also recommit to those core values that characterize the founding of the church. Fervent prayer for lost people everywhere. Great commission commitment to the whole world. Strong financial investment in world evangelization. A continued commitment to teach and disciple those that believe and receive Christ through our local efforts and a vision to reach the unreached from Hokessin, Delaware, to Hanover, Germany, to Hanoi, Vietnam, and everywhere in between. This is our purpose, and this is our prayer. <laughs>